and thanks everybody for joining. Um, it's great to be here today. And I hope that whoever you are and wherever you're joining from, um, you get something out of today, uh, be it if you're a student, maybe some of the projects that I've been involved in since working with the RCA um, are going to be of interest. If you are a designer and practitioner, um, I just think it's always lovely to share um, work and gain insight and into different sort of modes of working and uh, see what makes other designers tick. So hopefully um, there's something in that for you. And uh, if you're just a hobbyist and passionate about knitwear, hopefully something in this um, will, will strike you as interesting. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Um, so I will share my screen with you guys now and we will get going. I'll just pull it up to full view for everybody. Great. Okay. So my journey, I suppose, into knitwear began in uh, the Limerick School of Art and Design. So I'm, I live in Sligo, um, sort of Sligo Leitrim area. I'm grown up here, uh, but when it came to studying fashion and knitwear, Limerick was the draw for me. I was, um, I was offered a place at Kingston University, but I just stay in Ireland and to do my four years of developing my love um, and interest for knitwear at, at Limerick. And I suppose what really drew me to it was this fantastic freedom to play and manipulate materials, uh, generate your own fabrics and create three dimensional structures and and textural elements that really played with the body. And that for me was a, a huge draw. And I always suppose allowed the fabric to inform the garment design as I worked. Uh, and that has sort of stayed with me throughout all um, my recent knitwear work. So just to show you a little bit of my, my thought process, and I suppose this in, in a way links to that, that idea of the, the machine and how it can create the tension across different yarns and what happens then, the transformation of that fabric when it comes away from the machine. So as a designer, there's that element of control that you have, but then I love what happens when something comes off the machine and you see the yarn take back its twist and perform in a certain way. Uh, so it brings up interesting surprises and challenges uh, that I as a designer uh, kind of love to embrace and, and play with. So that's, um, I suppose, just a, uh, a short overview of, of some of the, the work and processes that I would have worked on through my earlier years in, in knitting. And that then for me led on to um, developing garments and processes that would have always been, as I say, informed by the fabric structure itself. So playing with different knitted structures on the machine, bringing them off, exploring the performative aspects of the fabric, sketching, bringing them onto the stand, manipulating on the stand, going back to the drawing board and sketching, um, investigating some structures in more depth and that sort of interplay always um, happening between the material and and the body seeing seeing what forms and garments kind of are spawned from from that so that's always been my sort of way of, of working really and that led me through my work that followed my BA, um, all my collections since, since the BA were based, I was, I, was, I was based in Ireland, so I was producing here, knitting here, and um, involved in Create, which is a wonderful design showcasing, showcasing project uh, run by Brown Thomas, which is part of the Selfridges group. So I would have had the opportunity to retail in store and get 
feedback from from customers over the over the years working um, in Brent Thomas. So that was really wonderful and helped to kind of further inform my my making and my my processes as well, I suppose. Um, so just a few looks from over the years there. And I suppose I came to a point with my work where I, I wanted to push it into another um, sphere as well. I wanted to investigate more uh, aspects of, of machine knitting itself. I was relatively limited in what I had access to. I had my own domestic brother machines and uh, I had access to a Shima machine that I was working with, but I was interested in exploring new ways of making through knit. So I applied for my MA at the Royal College of Art and Design. And I would have applied for the MA there back in 2013. I, I finished my, graduated from the Limerick School of Art and Design in 2012. I thought, you know, straight off the bat, let's go MA, here we come. And uh, Wendy Dagworth was um, head of the fashion department at the Royal College at that time. And I was, fortunate enough to get offered a place, which was wonderful. I was really excited, but I was also broke. So um, that didn't happen for me that year. I, I just decided, look, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll pause for a bit and, and, and see what happens um, in Ireland. And I had, I had wonderful opportunities with Brown Thomas and the chance to kind of build the brand a little bit and trial things and test things and see what worked and, and more importantly, what didn't work, I suppose. Uh, and that window led me to, um, yeah, just, a, a, I suppose a lot of learning through, through that time. Um, I also began teaching and developed a real passion for that. So over the years, I decided, you know what, after, I suppose, yeah, around sort of 2016, 17, I decided uh, time to have another bite at the old MA Apple. So um, at that point, Zoe Broach had taken over as head of fashion department. And uh, I, came, I came across this email and I just popped it up because I just, it, it, um, it made me smile. It was back in, back in my uh, Limerick School of Art and Design days, I applied for uh, an internship with Boudicca with Zoe Broach's label and uh, unfortunately this was this was the email for me to go along to my to my trial day to bring my portfolio and my my two images which you hold in in great esteem and I I just had to put that little email up because I think if any, anyone who has attended the RCA will know how how important it is to uh, to hold those visuals of yours in, in great esteem and be selective and, and edit. But um, yeah, for, for me, it was really lovely to have been offered the opportunity to go for a trial day and, and potentially have an, inter, uh, an internship uh, with Boudicca. I, I actually got offered a placement in Tokyo and decided that I would go for that. So I never had the opportunity to work with, with Zoe Roach back in 2011. And then when I got offered the place, uh, at the RCA in 2017. It was, um, yeah, it was just meant to be, I guess. I had uh, the opportunity to go and spend two years, two incredibly informative years in the knitwear department there. I, I applied for my MA in fashion design, being that I had not a uh, specialism at that point. I, I had a, a, a fashion design BA degree, but I didn't have a specialism in, in knitwear specifically. So I didn't think that that was uh, strong enough, I suppose, to, to, to apply for, for the um, knitwear department. But uh, they noted that my, that my portfolio was very knit heavy um, and would like to interview me for the department. So it was, it was, it was great to get the opportunity to really get in there and, and hone my skills and build on so many levels of technique, I suppose, when it, when it came to the machinery that uh, I had access to at the RCA. It was a whole new world 
and I got to push some of the aspects that I would have been exploring through my previous work through into a different area. And so with, with, moving, with moving to the RCA, it meant, it meant moving to London and I suppose two of the things that I was most reluctant, reluctant to leave were uh, the, the Irish coastline, um, particularly around here in Sligo, it, it blows me away. It's always um, somewhere I go to for that sense of uh, escape and release, clear the head, just um, it's, it's phenomenally powerful. Uh, so I, I knew I wasn't going to have that. And the other aspect that I was going to miss and wanted to bring with me if possible was my passion for aerial dance, which is a relatively new band passion, but I, I have, um, I've always been interested in dance for years and years. Um, uh, as when I was younger, I suppose, and then there was a there was a gap where I didn't get to explore it. Um, but in the last, I suppose, four to five years here in here in Sligo, I've had the opportunity to reignite that passion, and so that was something I was very reluctant to leave behind. So these two elements um, from Sligo, I really wanted to to bring with me, um, and I I suppose I really wanted to find a way in which I could capture the, the energies of these two passion places for me and bring them through into my garment development, into my material making um, and into some of the processes that I worked with as well. So that became an important focus point for me, um, drawing, from, drawing from home um, and finding ways of investigating machine knitting by incorporating different materials that would capture those moments. So um, if I just bring you back to these particular images, this was after one of our most intense storms um, along the coast and it generated this incredible sea foam and it was just phenomenal to watch. It would just channel through the gullies and float on the air and everything was weightless, but surging beneath the surface was this like raw intense energy. So I really wanted to, to capture that, that sort of weightlessness quality, that lightness, but also that um, surging beneath the surface. So sort of these aspects of, of pressure and release. And it linked really clearly to me for some reason um, to, to aerial dance and that it's, it's um, I suppose it's something that really kind of pushes you to the limits, but at the same time you have these moments of suspension and these weightless moments of, of soaring. Um, so all of those qualities I wanted to kind of capture and combine and bring through into my work. So I began the material investigations, as I say, initially working uh, with machine knitting. These structures were all developed on, on domestic machines, um, introducing flexible foams and seeing how I could generate that kind of push through, um, that surging energy coming through to the surface. So, um, Apologies, there goes a cement mixer. Um, and then I, I began sort of thinking about how I could focus these, uh, these moments of pressure and release on areas of the body that required it as well. Um, maybe there were certain pressure points, certain areas that needed uh, more focus, protection, insulation, etc. So all of this was uh, very playful, very exploratory, but led on uh, to informing a lot of the structures that I went on to work with through, um, be it with working with Dubia Machines, Brothers, Shima, and moving forward on to working with Santoni Machines in Shanghai. So these were just a couple of other developments. And what I found was that while I absolutely loved engaging with the, the, the material 
aspects of the the expanding elements of foam and dough and all the all the other weird and wonderful materials I was engaging with I did want these pieces to be refined elegant garments as well so I chose to kind of focus the surging and the energy element uh, in through the body and movement so the body and the movement brought that that aspect and that allowed me then to refine the garments a little bit more and look at how I could generate that I suppose yeah that sort of weightlessness that elegance and um, yeah sort of I suppose just really isolate the, the key elements that I wanted to, to bring through. So these were some stills of a, of a film that I worked on with um, an aerial dancer, Nicola Brody Scott. And it was wonderful being in London. I suppose there's, there are so many wonderful things about being in London, but one of the things was that I had access to a, a great community of, of creative people across all areas not only within the rca but beyond that and so being able to connect with the aerial dance community there and link in uh with with dancers to get them into my garments and to understand how things were working and how things weren't working was really important for me to kind of research in an active space so that was that was really wonderful and um also just nice to, to think about the documenting of it across different mediums as well. So not only through still photography, but through, through video and um, sound as well. So we had a nice time working on that aspect. And the, the material that I was working with primarily at that point, they were sort of more technical yarns that I was, I was working with and I was working on Dubier machines, Brother machines, and as I said before as well, on Shimasiki machines. So I was able to generate very interesting structures from very open work to finer gauge um, structures, but I wasn't able to get quite the fineness of quality that I wanted to produce. There were still certain things that felt a little bit uh, clunky and a little bit um, challenging. And some of the, the garments that I was working on initially were very much focused around cut and sew methods. So I was creating sheets essentially of the knitted fabric and, and treating it almost like a woven. So um, cut and sewing and assembling. And it was important, I think, for me to just do that, to get the idea of how the garment was going to, to look and feel and where the pressure points were, but with the main aim of moving that through into something that was more refined. So that went through various iterations, starting off with um, a bodysuit that I'm going to share with you now. So this particular one and I loved working on this bodysuit and it's, it's still uh, it's a piece that I love. I've got it here and I'll show you a little bit closer up when I, I stop sharing the screen with you. But it allowed me, I suppose, to explore lots of different structures across the, the surface of the suit. Um, thinking about breathability, thinking about areas that I needed to allow for extra movement. So rib structures, guillotte, drop stitch, um, all different things happening in different areas. But then I think there were sort of aesthetic elements that I found myself led towards that maybe weren't uh, necessary. There wasn't that functionality there, uh, but I'm, I'm always a little bit I, I, I find the editing process difficult at times. Um, I, I, I like to, to push things and then I suppose pull back from that. So this would have been um, the, the initial suit that, that led on to the development that became a little bit more refined, as I say. So this piece was uh, something that I worked on for my 
RCA graduate show and I was working on I was working on all of these pieces and thinking okay how can I move it to that next level so from here I did begin developing on the Shima machine which allowed me to integrate the structures more so there was more of a seamless quality to the garments but I came across Santoni who are um, they're an Italian knitting machine manufacturer they're based in Brescia uh, in Italy and then they are also based in Shanghai so they've got an R&D center out there as well and they run a program called the Santoni Pioneer program so I became very interested in thinking about how I could work with these machines because they're circular the nature of the structure means that we can integrate multiple elements into one sort of tubular form so there's more of a seamless quality to the garments um, less especially from from an active wear perspective you know less things to uh, cause any abrasion or any um, discomfort against the the body there's um, more balanced even pressure distributed I suppose and the the techniques and the, the the mode of working itself is is very sustainable and that you can integrate all these elements and get rid of what I was working with here which was cut and sew method uh, so with a with a tubular knitted structure you can integrate all those performative structure qualities and leave with with zero to well very little waste um, in in some cases but uh, a lot of a lot of garments and a lot of pieces can be created with zero waste so it's it, that really really appealed to me from a sustainability point of view as well and uh, I applied for the for the program. I was accepted, which was wonderful. Um, then I had to talk to all my tutors and Zoe uh, to say that I'd been offered this. This was in advance of our graduate show, so it meant flying out to Shanghai. Uh, I still had final fittings to do. It would. It meant that I I wasn't present for my own graduate show, and it was that was that was a tough call you know um I spent two intense years with with people uh sharing the highs and the lows of of an MA um full full immersion uh and then sort of taking myself out of that I felt like I felt quite vulnerable in a way but um Zoe and Carlo all my tutors were so supportive it was wonderful um and so off i went to shanghai to begin the the next phase of of iterations of 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 this collection so that brought me to santoni out in shanghai and allowed me to play with all of their wonderful machinery um different circular machines that and that was a big draw for me to go from working with quite, um, you know, bordering on chunky, something down to very, very, very fine um, 28 gauge. You know, it was, it, was it was really nice to be able to bring something down very, very fine, especially considering I was uh, developing garments focused towards aerial dancers focused towards fluidity weightlessness all of those aspects that i wanted to bring through so um i spent a couple of months there researching playing developing um and refining the garments into something that was much more seamless so we can see on the on the right um still incorporating all those structural elements that I wanted to have but but taking taking away the the seaming um, and making something that uh, was more ergonomic as well so it was a wonderful experience getting to getting to be out there and develop uh, a move on shall we say from from the work that I was doing at the RCA and and that in itself came together to be a really nice 
body of work that I put forward for the, the Walmart company. Um, so they, they run a project called the Walmart Performance Challenge. And in 2019, it was partnered with Adidas. So it was, it sounded like a great fit for me. I wanted to keep learning, keep pushing. Um, so I applied for the Walmart Performance Challenge and was accepted onto it as a, as a finalist. It was wonderful because it was really, they, they have such a global network. Um, it was, it was funny last year that they decided to do the, their workshops in Shanghai. So I, I was in Shanghai, I came back for, to, back to Sligo, had, I suppose, I don't know, maybe six weeks or so to kind of recharge, get my head together and boom, back out to Shanghai. Um, but it was, it was fantastic working with them out in there, uh, getting to visit the, the mills and things like that, I suppose that was a, that was a big thing for me as a knitter to, to see all the processing elements of the yarn. And uh, I, I come from a, a farming background myself. So, you know, wool to spun yarn is, is not a huge mystery to me, but at the same time to see it done on such a phenomenal scale uh, was really eye opening. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to link with some brilliant uh, spinners. So Sudwala um, and UPW and various other um, spinners. I was, I was very interested in working with, with yarn producers that are working with Merino wool, being that the Walmart Performance Company and Adidas had a real focus around sustainability and working with Merino wool, its incredible performative properties. Um, so that was really important to me as well. So that, that aligned nicely and allowed me to, to move some of the initial developments that I was working on at Santoni into Merino wools. Uh, it brought its own challenges because uh, Merino wool and wool in general doesn't perform like techy nylons and um, yeah, more sort of, sort of technical yarns is a little bit more um, trial and error, shall we say, but in general it was absolutely fantastic to have to have the opportunity to to work these machines and understand their limitations um, so we the result was we managed to get a really beautifully refined bodysuit uh, created out of um, merino wool and tensile so it's got a lovely weightless light quality to it it's breathable um, the antibacterial properties of merino wool are phenomenal so uh, great to be able to integrate that aspect as well. And that's, I suppose, in a nutshell, how, how it went from looking at these, um, these, these structures which had performative qualities, but also um, the, the challenges that I was facing with, with some of the, the weightier elements of the garment and bringing it through into something that was far more refined um, and yeah I think it's it's incredible what can can be done with the machines and I think in knit, knitwear in general you know it spans such a breadth there's everything from huge chunky knitwear that we associate with um, you know swaddling ourselves in and snuggling up in right down to the finest of, of gauges and you know, our, our, our main base layers, our, our socks, our pants, everything um, closest to our skin is, is generally knitwear. So I, I just think it's a fascinating area to be involved in. I'm so grateful that I've had the chance to explore it in the way I have so far. Um, this year, I'm really excited to be involved in It's 2020, which is international talent support um, in Trieste. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to travel there um, this year for the award ceremony. Um, it's going to go digital, but it's still a phenomenal opportunity to be a part of that and really excited to see where that leads. Uh, with, with that particular uh, award, I'm, uh, it, I'm actually focusing on accessories, so it's more of a footwear development. So I can share with you a little 
bit on those once again focused around the circular and seamless um, properties that uh, the Santoni machines afford. The, the knit designer, so that's what I've been working with um, to bring things into a, a new and exciting space for footwear. Once again, keeping that theme of pressure and release, so thinking about uh, the body during those intense training sessions, but also thinking about the body in a post-workout recovery context. So trying to think about um, what, what can be integrated into the, the garments, what yarns can be used and what other materials can be brought in that um, assist the body in recovering. So um, yeah, these are just sort of a, a fun uh, project that I've, I've had I've had an amazing time working on and I've had a really great response to so I'm 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 liking to be may, maybe working on, on a little bit of a smaller scale as well um, for, for a while it's it's um, it's nice to branch out into into something something new so that's um, that's where I'm I'm up to with everything at the moment uh, that's the journey thus far so um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear any questions people have. And um, yeah, I, ho I hope some of the language wasn't too alienating. If it wasn't enough, let me know. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, any questions, please. <laughs> I'll stop sharing now and I'll actually Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing and maybe, I know you're talking about showing some of the garments kind of up close. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, this one, just to show you up close, is the, the white bodysuit. So just to show you some of those elements that I was talking about, as I say, it's cut and sew, so, um, some nice, sort of breathable structures in the in the guillage and ribs it's a fun drop stitch element here on the shoulders and arms to give a little bit more room to maneuver and uh, this panel here purely purely aesthetic no no function here full disclaimer um but uh it was just something I, I wanted to, to add on. I was looking at different ways of, of binding and, and bonding the fabrics. And I suppose because of the, the cut and sew aspect, trying to think about ways to integrate uh, other details. that in a way amplify that, uh, some that the sky's seeming, but um, others that kind of draw attention, I suppose, and, and create more sort of ergonomic lines throughout the garment. So it's quite, it's quite a weighty piece in general, this one. But one of the, the comments I had from um, my one of my dancers, uh, thank you, Shanna. Uh, she she really was interested in the potential for it for more outdoor aerial performances. So I suppose in a way we think of, of dance wear and active wear as being very kind of, you know, fine, lightweight. Um, at the same time for, for aerial dance, an awful lot of um, the actual equipment and apparatuses can be they, they can be abrasive, they can be tough on the body, uh, especially if you're wearing, say, a harness and running 50 foot up a wall, you know. Um, so she was, she, was, she was thinking back to an Edinburgh festival that she'd been involved in and, uh, yeah, was wishing that she'd had a little bit more comfort and support and warmth uh, for that. So that was, you know, I think there's, there is always going to be a need for for heavier weight um, knit, but I suppose 
I was very keen to see how I could move it into something that was, was lighter, was more um, refined. So this, this piece is the Merino version. I'm hoping you can see, I feel like I'm looking at a little kind of a small square of myself. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you're getting quite the right. Yeah, well, I can see it in my screen perfectly. So thanks. Sorry. for that. Thanks, Shauna. <laughs> uh, but yeah, with this piece, I suppose it's very much about thinking around taking some of those structures, the, the drop stitch aspect, for example, um, the rib element, although this is all single jersey, this piece. So already it's much lighter. Um, there would have, there would have been some um, yeah, double jersey aspects to the larger suit, which m immediately is going to make it much, much weightier. But still some of the elements that I was able to, to add here, the, the sort of the mock rib creates channels on the inside of the garment. You can see here. So the idea is that through these little floating channels, um, I've fed uh, elastic, um, giving it that sort of, I suppose in a way that that uh, nature of, of, of the resistant bands. So the idea being that you can have these integrated resistant bands in certain sections of the garment. So if it's something where somebody is, is looking at strength building or is looking at coming back from injury and focusing recovery in a certain area, then those can be kind of modified or customized according to the needs of the wearer. Um, so there's going to be more built-in resistance in those, in those particular sections. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lovely, it's a lovely quality the, with the Merino. It's that, that softness you'd expect from wool, but that kind of cool lightness as well with the tensile. Um, so yeah. That's great, Rebecca. We have a couple of questions. First of all, I think it's actually just such a lovely, it's really interesting to hear the connection to aerial dance and obviously you're thinking of your audience when you're creating some of these, which is lovely. Um, one question was, ultimately, do you see yourself directing your designs more commercially or bespoke or how do you see you, yourself directing them? Yeah, I think definitely more commercially. Like the, the I suppose the, the journey through uh, the MA itself it's that safe space to explore and to play and there there are no boundaries um which is always the dream but in reality out the other side of that it's kind of like okay you know how how does this play out and so i think i began thinking about that in a much more sort of focused way in my second year with with the idea of thinking right okay how how can this move forward so linking with santoni out in shanghai shanghai isn't an ideal solution for me at the moment um well look n not, nothing's ideal at the moment shall we say uh but i'm definitely looking at building on the connections i made there but moving it closer to home so potentially production within Italy or working with clients that um, Santoni actually has because they are at the end of the day the machine manufacturers so they distribute globally um, not to Ireland yet but hey let's see. Um, well so. speaking of, uh, of moving closer to home that was another question was have you considered um, or have you already looked at exploring Irish wool opportunities and um, because you had previously mentioned your understanding of farm to yarn. Yes, yeah, it's, it's one of these things where um, I, I would love to and, and it's always kind of been a little bit of a, of, a, of a dream to potentially, you know, get that flock number and, and, and see what fancy breeds um, I could, I could even you know, farm myself here, my, my parents uh, farm on a, on, a, on a small scale. But the wool that we produce is not of high enough quality. Um, really, it's especially where we are in, in the west of Ireland, the weather has a huge part to play in that. And 
Um, I'd love to say that I, I begin producing garments with Irish wool, but it's, um, I, I'm a long way off making any such commitment, unfortunately. But I think there's, there's a lot more that can be done with Irish wool. At the moment, we see it mostly being used for insulation um, or going for rug making. Um, but I, I still think that, that there, could be, there could be more done in Ireland to support farmers who might be interested in, in getting into specialist breeds of, of sheep that are going to produce uh, different qualities of wool. Because at the end of the day, merino wool from the merino sheep, most of the, the yarn that I've been working with is, is coming from Australia. So it's, it's wool mark licensed um, from Australian wool producers. Uh, New Zealand obviously will produce good quality merino wool as well, but it's, it's not something um, that we are best placed to do climate wise, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. I, I, I would if I could. Is, <laughs> is as No, that, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> another question is, do you have a favorite knitwear designer or possibly you might have a few? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I suppose I found myself kind of thinking about, um, all sorts of knitwear designers recently, um, and it, I, uh, Italian knitwear designers. Um, being that I was chatting, I was chatting with somebody the other day about Italian knitwear designers. But um, we are just, I suppose, that the the heritage of you know Masonian places like this, you know, houses that have that that family connection and heritage linked to them. I think, as as an Irish designer, I really appreciate because I think there's a wonderful heritage in knitwear here um, and that generational feed down um, which I hope we'll be able to maintain. I know what what I'm producing and developing at the moment isn't kind of in that heritage bracket but at the same time I, I love to think that I'll be able to um, I, I suppose yeah give, give something to to Irish knitwear that uh, will will stand the test of time down the line, um, but I think yeah I suppose I suppose um, yeah knitting heritage brands and um, and and Irish knitwear companies as well, uh, Ross Duke and, and and people who are doing wonderful knitwear. So um, yeah. I think that leads nicely into the next question, which is what uh, would you like to do next? Oh, do next. Um, I, well, I've, I've got so many things kind of spinning around. Uh, I've, I've got a project that I'm working on at the moment that's more textile material focused that I'm really enjoying. Um, it connects to all the, all the work that I've been doing over the last few years, but it's, I suppose you, you find yourself working in one direction and then there are little sort of offshoots that you never at that point in time get the opportunity to explore in full. So now having come out the other side of the AMA, um, having a little bit of reflective time um, over the last few months, as we all have, I found myself kind of thinking, okay, I'm gonna pick up the pieces of, of, of little bits that um, spark my interest. So one of those is more of a, of a textiles uh, focused project um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching as well at the moment so I, I really love that aspect of I suppose at the moment exploring new ways to to engage with people um, through the, the tactile element of, of, of what I do is so important the making side of things it's how how do we move forward with that I think that's a big challenge for me as uh, as a maker trying to communicate things across, you know, um, this medium. And so I think the, the next stages for me as well are, are thinking around that, thinking about new, new languages, new ways of documenting various things that um, are going to sort of 
stand to us down the line because while this is by no means over, you know, we're we're going to we're going to face other challenges. And um, I think if if working out in China has taught me anything, it's that you know communication is 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 challenging at times. So how how are we best placed to uh, move forward with that in terms of the language that we're using around knitwear specifically in, in my space um, and and you know the the visual recording of of things for for others for learning um, so that's that's kind of where my head's at at the moment Great, Rebecca. Uh, one other question I think it was leading on from earlier on when we were talking about the Irish wool. One person is asking about alpacas. Have you ever used the wool? No, I haven't. I haven't. Um, I've got uh, cousins actually who have alpacas, so I must, I must get some. Um, new alpacas. project. <laughs> yeah, new project. 2021, people. <laughs> And Marion from the Irish Designers Emporium is just saying, um, well done and it's lovely to hear from you. Oh, lovely to see you, Marion. Well, not see you, but yeah, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for joining. Uh -huh. um, another person just asking about what was your experience of Shanghai? Um, I had a wonderful time there, to be honest. I, I love to travel um, and I eat almost everything, <laughs> which helps. Um, for, for me, it was a fantastic adventure. Uh, yeah, I suppose the, the language side of things is always going to be tricky for, for us in the factory. It was working sort of between Chinese, Italian, English, um, but we all managed to find our level. And there, oh, there really weren't that many barriers. I think I, I, um, I found that I, I was very well prepped before I, I went over there. Um, just just for just simple things, I, I reached out to people who would have, have traveled and, and worked in China before. So, um, and I have a, a lot of friends from the RCA as well who who were very helpful in cluing me in before I went over there. But I, I, had, a, I had a wonderful time. Um, I couldn't get out and exercise quite as much as I wanted. It was a bit bit too smoggy in Shanghai for that but um, aside from that no it was wonderful. Great if anyone has any other questions please do keep continuing to type them in. And I love how you've got the obviously the footwear in the hanging up there in the background. Is there anything else you want to show us a little sneak peek of, Rebecca? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's just a fun board, really, of, of bits and bobs. I suppose this was just some of the... Um, just to show that kind of play that I love from coming... Something coming off the machine, it can be so taut. And the tension driving across it is giving you this really defined structure but then the collapsibility of it uh, when it comes away from the machine and what forms then that goes on to uh, to generate and inspire but then for me you know there, there was an aspect of the of the structural element that I didn't want to to lose in some places so I began sort of introducing different uh, solutions that would allow me to to give a much more structured and and well not three-dimensional because it's obviously three-dimensional itself but it really holds the form so this was using um what did i use with that so it was more like a it was a glue solution to soak the soak the yarn and then it allows me to kind of manipulate and play with it so i suppose yeah that's that idea of incorporating other materials, seeing how they play with one another. And um, these are some of the little sock structure developments. So, so, so all of that would have come from um, initially working on my brother machine that literally can sit right here on the table and I can work away on that and then bring those samples to, to the technicians and go through how uh, we can 
edit, scale up, scale down, um, develop it for, for the circular machine. So the, these are just a couple of the pieces that I was working on over there for the footwear. And this is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a really nice um, yarn. It has thermoplastic properties. So there's elements of it when heated will shrink down and can create uh, a more sort of robust structure for the base of the footwear. And then the top is all uh, soft, cozy merino. So that's uh, just one of those little pieces. And then this is a little playful. It's actually amazing to see them up close, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you can see that. I feel like I'm watching a little pinprick. I'm like, can you guys see me? Um, no, we definitely can. And one person, just when you were talking about the circular machinery, was asking if you'd ever considering acquiring your own machinery and manufacturing in Ireland. And she obviously is referring to that circular knitting machine. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is now, that's the dream, all right. Um, and it, it, the, the thing of it is, is there's, there's a number of stages to it because while I would be perfectly capable to work with and operate certain machines, these machines I'm not clued in in the actual programming of. So they, so I work by sampling and generating different structures that are then programmed, read by the machines and knitted off. So there's, there would still be another chapter of learning for me to do before I would be in a position to able to be able to operate and run run the machines myself, uh, that's something I am really interested in doing though because I think there's tremendous potential for them. Not only you know for me to to run solely as you know a, a designer here, um, working on working on my own collections. They they they're they're phenomenally um, efficient machines. So I would be able to, you know, connect with other designers who are maybe interested in working in this particular area or innovation hubs, um, you know, any colleges, universities that were interested um, in, in potentially working with them because they not only focus uh, towards the, the fashion industry, but they have I suppose in much smaller diameter machines, um, there's a large market for them in the, in the medical and pharmaceutical sector as well. So there's, I, I would love to think that there's, there's potential to, to get one. Um, and then it's about looking at, uh, as I say, just that, that little added bit of, of upskilling um, that not only I would want to do, I want to have, um, uh, a support technician with me working on that so yeah that that will be the next chapter great Rebecca and I think we've two more questions I, I'm aware that we're coming up on an hour at the moment and um, thanks everyone for all your questions and sticking with us so one is where you're teaching at the moment and the second which is a lovely question is if you've ever been drawn to costume design mm. Okay, so um, teaching at the moment uh, at the Limerick School of Art and Design, so back at my alma mater, um, and uh, here in Sligo as well at St Andrews College, which is part of NUIG. And yeah, in relation to the second question, uh, 100%, I think, you know, everything is a costume in a way. You know, we get up and we transform ourselves in some way, shape or form. So. Um, yeah, there's, I think the, 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 the aspect of costume and that idea has always been there. Um, not necessarily that I would go into um, I, I, I don't, I think, I think, for, I think, I feel like I'm already there in a way because I've been working with, with dancers and that comes from a place uh, for me that's um, an area of passion you know I, I've loved dancing since an early age and and grew up surrounded by all, all the the costume and uh, noise and excitement that goes with that so um, I think that that'll always that'll always be present um, and even even 
with the most simple, refined garments, um, they can be placed in a in a performance space um, and and become costume. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's the 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 interplay. I think it's. It's 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 there and it's 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 something I I feel like I, I almost already dip into yeah. That's brilliant, Rebecca. Um, I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. I've just shared the link with everyone. If you'd like to find out any more information on Get Ireland Making, you can go on to the website, which is dcci.ie forward slash Get Ireland Making. Um, I. Yeah, I don't see any other questions coming in. I just want to say a huge thank you again to Rebecca for sharing all of that with us today. The presentation was lovely, the images, and it was really lovely to get a sneak peek of everything around you there in, <laughs> in the studio. And um, so thanks again for, for doing all of that for us. And a huge thank you to all of our audience for joining us. Um, hopefully you can make our first crafted podcast, which is on next Tuesday at three o'clock. Um, as I said, the full list of webinars are in that website link. And if you'd like any other information, you can email us directly at getirelandmaking at dcci.ie. Um, but yeah, I think we'll finish it there. A huge thank you, Rebecca, again, and to everyone. And we hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, for joining. Thanks guys. Mm -hmm.